Hello everybody. Today I'm going to show you how to create a simple cross-platform .NET desktop application that can be controlled entirely with offline voice commands. We're going to use PicoVoices .NET SDK to voice enable our application, and our GUI will be made cross-platform thanks to a framework called Avalonia. Let's get started. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a new project in Visual Studio using the Avalonia MBBM application template. And that's something you can get by downloading Avalonia's Visual Studio extension. So we'll create a new project here called Avalonia VUI, that stands for Voice User Interface. And we'll just hit the Build button first so that we can see the UI designer. Okay, and you can see the Avalonia template gives us uh, some template code here, a main window and a main window view model. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to add the Pico Voice Porcupine NuGet package. That's going to allow us to import the Porcupine engine. So once it installs, you're actually going to see a lib and resource directory. And in the resources directory under Windows, you'll see that we have some built-in keywords here. You can see we have blueberry, bumblebee, grapefruit, grasshopper. We're going to be using these four words as voice commands for our UI. Uh, so let's go ahead and design our UI. We're going to open up main window.axaml. And we're going to delete the uh, template code. And what we're going to do is we're going to start by adding a stack panel and center it. And then within that stack panel, we're going to add four radio buttons. And we're going to add them all to a group called wake words. And set the margin to five to separate them a bit. And we're going to put each of the wake words the voice commands that I was talking about earlier, uh, we're going to put those as the content of these radio buttons. So we've got grapefruit, grasshopper, and bumblebee, and blueberry. Okay, so there we go. And we're going to make the window just a bit smaller because we don't need all that window space. Okay, so there's our very basic UI. Now we're going to head to the main window view model.cs and we're going to add the bindings for the UI. Uh, so we'll add a couple namespaces here to help us with the bindings. And we're going to add a binding for each of the is checked properties uh, on those radio buttons we created. So each one's going to have its own Boolean that it's going to trigger in the view model uh, and we're going to call them since it's attached to the is checked property, we're just going to call them like is grapefruit and is grasshopper, is bumblebee, is blueberry, and so on. And the raise and set if changed function is going to tell our UI that we've changed these values in the code behind. Okay, so now that we have our variables in the code behind. We're going to add the binding code to our main window XAML. Uh, so we're going to, for the is checked property, we're going to bind each one to its associated Boolean in the code behind. So here we have is checked is bound to is grapefruit, is checked bound to is grasshopper, and so on. Okay. So now we actually want these radio buttons to do something when we select the different values. Uh, so in this demo, we're going to make it change the background color of the window. Uh, so we're going to go over to the view model and add the variables that we're going to bind the uh, color of the window background to. So we're going to add a color variable called background color. And we're going to set its default value to light gray. And then we'll have the public version that we're actually going to bind to called background color. And we're also going to add the getter and setter uh, the same way we did for the is checked property. And then we're going to want a list of colors to choose from. Uh, as we switch between the different radio buttons. So we're going to create a new list of colors here. We're going to have four different ones for the 
one for each of the four radio buttons. And for grapefruit, we'll make the background color change to light pink. And for grasshopper, long green. And for bumblebee, yellow. And for blueberry, blue violet. So that they have some associations with the uh, words we're saying. Now we're going to add the code that actually swaps the color out. Um, so in the setter of each of the is check properties, we're going to change the value of the background color property. And that will, since that is bound to the window color, the window color will change in the UI whenever we set one of these is checked properties. So a quick build here just to make sure there are no errors. And then we'll head over to the main window XAML and actually add the UI code that's going to bind to our background color. So window.background here, and then we'll bind the color property to the solid color brush. And that's how we actually bind that color variable to the background color. So now we'll launch it and I'll show you what it looks like if we just use mouse clicks to go between the four radio buttons. So you can see every time we go to one, the background color changes. Perfect. So now we need to voice enable this. So we're going to import the Pico Voice namespace, PV, and we're going to start adding code to actually create an instance of our wake word engine, Porcupine, and we're going to have it detect our four keywords. So here we're going to call the create factory method and give it our list of built-in keywords that we want to access. So a new list of strings, and we're just going to pass it the strings of the wake words that we want. So we want grapefruit, grasshopper, bumblebee, and blueberry. And we're going to put the using keyword in front of it so that it will automatically dispose of its resources uh, after we're done using it. So now we're going to actually have to add some audio capabilities to our app. And we need to do so in a cross-platform way since our UI framework is cross-platform. So there's a great library out there called OpenTK, and you can grab their NuGet package. And within it is something called OpenAL, which is the open audio language and it's a cross-platform audio language. So it's gonna allow us to access our microphone no matter whether we're running on Linux, Mac, or Window. So we'll import the OpenAL namespace here, and then we're gonna create a buffer. Uh, our audio samples are 16-bit, so it's gonna be a buffer of shorts. And for processing, Porcupine has a specific frame length that it requires, uh, which is helpfully exposed as a property here so now we're going to create our OpenAL capture device, which is the class that actually holds a reference to uh, our microphone hardware. Uh, so we'll use the capture open device, give it a null for device name, so it uses the default device. And Porcupine requires a specific sample rate, and we're going to record in mono 16-bit, and the buffer size is in bytes, uh, so we're actually going to multiply our frame length, which is in sample form, uh, by 2. So the first thing we're going to do is tell the microphone to start capturing audio. And we'll do that with alc.captureStart and pass it the capture device that we've just created. And the next thing we're going to do is actually add a loop to take audio from the microphone and put it into our frame buffer. And we're going to put this on a separate thread so that it doesn't block the UI thread. So we're going to import system.threading.tasks and create a new task for audio capture. So now let's actually write the audio capture loop. Uh, so we'll make a while statement here. And we're just going to make it an infinite loop. Uh, obviously in proper code we would want uh, some proper cancellation here, but for the purposes of this tutorial we're just going to do it the lazy way. Uh, so we're going to in this loop, we're going to constantly pester the microphone and ask how many samples it has available. And if it has one full porcupine frame of data available, so samples available greater than porcupine.frame length, 
Then we will grab the samples from the capture device and move them over to our frame buffer. So we give it a pointer to the buffer and we tell it to copy this many samples. So now that our frame buffer is full, we're going to pass it to porcupine.process, which is going to allow porcupine to look for the keyword in this frame. And it's going to return a keyword index, which is the index of the keyword that it's detected. So it could also return a minus one, which just means it found no keyword. So we only really care if the keyword index is greater than or equal to zero. And we're going to write a switch statement to decide which keyword was spoken. And depending on the keyword that was spoken, we're going to toggle the radio button by setting the property that it's bound to in the code behind to true. So if we detect grapefruit, we'll set is grapefruit to true. If we detect grasshopper, is grasshopper to true, and so on for bumblebee and blueberry. Okay, and that should be all the code we're writing. So we'll quickly give it a test by launching the app. And drag it over here and say grapefruit. Grasshopper, bumblebee, blueberry, and there you go. Thanks for watching.